Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on uh, lipid modifications of proteins. Okay, right. Uh, so in this video, what we're going to talk about is the RAS proteins. And the reason we're going to talk about the RAS proteins is that uh, palmitoylation of the RAS proteins and its role in uh, targeting RAS proteins into membranes has been very vastly studied, basically. So, we're going to study RAS proteins um, because of the importance of lipid modification to RAS proteins in targeting them to the cell membrane. And there is uh, some interest in whether by blocking the palmitoylation of the RAS proteins, you could stop the localization of the RAS proteins to the membranes, and uh, whether this would be effective at blocking uh, the um, the MAP kinase ERK pathway, which is often overactive in tumors. Okay. Uh, and that's the, that's the major signaling pathway that RAS proteins are involved in, the MAP kinase ERK pathway. Okay, uh, so if we could stop them getting to the membrane, then maybe we could stop them from actually functioning in that pathway, and thereby stop the overactivation of that pathway. And it is the overactivation of that pathway that leads to the overproliferation. Well, it's one of the factors that leads to overproliferation in uh, tumor cells. Okay, so there is some interest as to whether uh, s the study of uh, RAS protein uh, palmitoylation and uh, how it targets RAS proteins into membranes uh, could be used therapeutically. Okay, right. Uh, so, the structure for this video then, we'll start off by looking at the three different genes that you have for RAS proteins. We'll then look at the four different RAS proteins that there are. We'll have a very basic discussion of the structure of the RAS proteins. Uh, we will then talk about uh, their synthesis and then we'll look at uh, their post-translational modifications where you add lipid molecules onto them and then target them for uh, the plasma membrane. Okay, right, uh, so we'll start off with the genes for RAS proteins. So there are only three genes even though there are four RAS proteins. Okay, so the three genes that you have for RAS proteins are you have a gene called the KRAS gene, okay, and sometimes these are also written K, and then you put a dash, and then RAS. Okay, so sometimes people will write this, uh, where it's all capitals and all together. Other times people will write this, where you have capital K, uh, and then a dash, a capital R, and then the A and the S are lowercase. Uh, they're both uh, the same. Okay, then there's also the NRAS gene. Okay, and again, uh, this can also be written as N, and then RAS in this way as well, R and then lowercase a, lowercase s, okay, and then finally there's also the HRAS gene, and again this can be written in both styles, it can either be written in all capitals, or where you just have the H and the R in capitals, and a dash between the H and the R. Okay, so these are the three genes that you have uh, for um, these uh, RAS proteins. Okay, now let me just remind you of the central dogma of biology, because it's going to be actually become important if we want to understand why there are two, well, why there are four uh, RAS proteins and only three RAS genes. Okay, so it's the KRAS gene which is capable of producing two different proteins, so we'll study the KRAS gene. NRAS and HRAS only produce one protein. Okay, so, let's say that this little strip of DNA here represents the KRAS gene here. Okay, and now what's going to happen is this KRAS gene is going to be transcribed into a piece of mRNA, and that mRNA uh, will then uh, be spliced, okay, and it will become a mature piece of mRNA, and then it will go into the um, cytoplasm and be translated into the KRAS protein. Now, basically, if we draw a cheaper picture where I just show the two strands like this, okay, so I don't show the uh, twisting of the two strands round one another, okay, what will happen is 
you will transcribe one of these two strands, okay? So let's say that this turquoise strand here uh, is the coding strand. So you will make a piece of RNA that is initially completely complementary to the coding strand here. So let me colour in this uh, piece of mRNA here. Okay, and this is what is known as a pre-mRNA. Okay, so this piece of mRNA will not actually be um, translated. You have to splice it first. And the reason is that there are loads of portions within this pre-mRNA that uh, you don't want uh, to be in the final protein, basically. Okay, right. So, if we now look at the pre-mRNA here, okay, so I've pulled out this uh, piece of pre-mRNA, so there are certain portions of the pre-mRNA that actually need to be translated. So let's mark these out. So let's say this is a portion that needs to be translated. Then there are other portions that don't need to be translated. So let me highlight in the portions that do need to be translated. So this is a portion that has to be translated. Then it's followed by a portion that doesn't need to be translated. And then another strip that does need to be translated here. Okay. And uh, then maybe another bit here that doesn't need to be translated. Now this is just to show the concept. It's not meant to be uh, an actual uh, representation of the pre-mRNA for this gene. I don't know how many uh, fragments that you have that absolutely need to be translated uh, for the KRAS gene. But these portions that do need to be translated, those are called exons. Okay, and the portions in between that are kind of like junk DNA, they don't actually uh, code for protein. These are called introns. Okay, so in the pre-mRNA you have portions that you need to remove basically, and I apologize for saying DNA earlier. This, should, this is a piece of RNA, not DNA. Okay, so the portions of the RNA that aren't actually going to be translated, uh, these are called the introns. Okay, so what's going to now happen is you're going to cut out these introns from the piece of mRNA and then you will glue the exons back together. Now, there will be uh, one situation where there is um, two possibilities, basically. So, let me give you an example of how this could happen. So, let's say, and again, this is just to show the concept, okay, this isn't actually how it works for KRAS. Well, it might be, I don't know, but I don't know the actual specifics for KRAS. But to show the concepts, let's say that this first exon here is absolutely essential, okay? So we'll call this exon 1, we'll call this middle exon here exon 2, and this final exon, exon 3. Whereas, exon 2 and exon 3, you have one or the other, basically. So, to make the mature piece of mRNA, you always use exon 1, but then you have a choice as to whether to use exon 2 or exon 3. So effectively, they both code for the same part of the enzyme as each other, but uh, they'll both give a slightly different uh, portion of that enzyme, basically. So, well, let me show this. So, basically, if we have our RAS protein here, Let's say this portion here is the portion that's coded for by exon 1, and this portion here will be coded for either by exon 2 or exon 3, and they will code for slightly different variants of this, basically. Okay, so, if you make your mature piece of mRNA so that it contains exon 1 and exon 2, that will make a certain form of KRAS, and if you uh, use make your mature piece of mRNA so that it has exon 1 and exon 3, that will code for a different form of KRAS. And this is basically what is meant by there being different splice variants, basically. So even though we are using the same gene, we can overall make different pieces of mature mRNA, which will then code for different proteins, basically, or at least slightly different proteins. So these two different types of proteins that you'll then produce are called the different splice variants. Okay, so basically, KRAS has two different splice variants, and I don't quite understand why they're called this, but they're called KRAS 4A, and they're called KRAS 4B. Okay, so these 
two forms of the KRAS protein are both produced by the KRAS gene, but the way that you get the difference is that they're different splice variants. So the exons that you used uh, in making the mature piece of mRNA which coded for KRAS4A were different from the exons which you used um, to make the mature piece of mRNA for KRAS4B. Okay, right. So that overall leaves us with four different proteins. There are KRAS4A and KRAS4B, which are the two different splice variants of KRAS. And there is then the NRAS protein. Okay, so there's only one protein that you produce from the NRAS gene. And then there's also the HRAS protein. Okay, right. Uh, so we now have our four different um, RAS proteins that are present within a cell. Okay, so now we're going to have a very basic uh, discussion of the structure of a RAS protein. Okay, so a RAS protein fundamentally is a single polypeptide. Okay, so it has an amino terminus over here. Okay, and then it has a carboxylic acid terminus over here. Right. Now, the portion of the poly... well, there is a portion right at the end of the polypeptide, i.e. near to the carboxy terminus, that is known as the HVR, okay? And HVR stands for um, hypervariable region, okay? So the H is for hyper, which means too much or a lot, and then V is for variable, so very variable, and then the R is for region. Okay, now what's going to happen is this region is going to be very important. This is where you're going to add palmitoyl groups on, and you're also going to add other groups than just palmitoyl groups. You're also going to add uh, farnesyl groups, and we'll discuss that in a moment. Now, right at the end of the hypervariable region, you have something that is known as a Cax box. Okay? And this is re actually right at the end of the polypeptide. So, if we look at the right end of the polypeptide, so we're zooming in to this right end here, and we look at the final four amino acids, okay? So here are the final four amino acids, and then the final one then has this free carboxylic acid group, which produces the carboxy terminus. Okay, so these amino acids, uh, well, this Cax box name, is, na is named CAXBOX because it stands for the amino acids that you have in these four terminal positions of the polypeptide. So basically, all RAS proteins are what are known as CAXBOX proteins, which means that at the end of their uh, polypeptide uh, chain, they have, um, for in the fourth amino acid in from the end, they have a cysteine amino acid. Then in the third and second position in from the end, uh, they then have what are known as aliphatic amino acids. Okay, so this does not stand for alanine, basically. Instead, this stands for aliphatic, okay? And I'll give you some examples of aliphatic amino acids in a moment, okay? And then in final position, they have an X amino acid. Okay, and this CAX box is going to be important because this is where we're going to uh, farnesylate. Uh, well, we're going to farnesylate uh, the uh, polypeptide, basically. Okay, now of course the polypeptide isn't going to remain in this linear structure. It will fold into a tertiary structure, uh, the tertiary structure of the RAS protein. Okay, now what we're going to turn our attention to now is. Um, the synthesis and then the lipid modifications that we're going to make. Okay, but we'll turn our attention to that in the next video.